Welcome to this episode of Chatting the Pictures. My name is Kara Finnegan, and I'm a writer, teacher, and historian of photography. And I'm Michael Shaw. I'm a writer, a psychologist, and also the publisher of Reading the Pictures. Why don't we dive into our first segment, which we call The News. And here, we're interested in how news photos tell a story. This photograph was taken by Anna Moneymaker for the New York Times. The photo was taken at a July 4th weekend political rally for the president at Mount Rushmore before almost 4,000 guests. The crowd was largely unmasked and not socially distanced, and the president gave a divisive speech about American heritage. This is really a picture worthy of Ronald Reagan era visual mastermind Michael Deaver, who very famously constructed images and environments and iconic spaces around President Reagan as he spoke during his presidency. And you can sort of see what they're going for here. But to me, the take is just too much of everything. Stars and flags and monuments and piccolos and the Blue Angels. It's just visually over overwhelming, isn't it? It really is indicative. And especially as we get down to what could be the last throws or final days of the Trump administration, it it does have that kitchen sink feeling to it more than usual. It is a visual bombardment. And what's great is that Anna goes for all of it. This picture gets at that whole smorgasbord. In some ways, this is the kind of image the Trump administration would have wanted to come out, right? Because it has everything. But you're right. Moneymaker, her perspective, even though it's the one that presumably was given to the pool photographers, she makes it about something more. And also at the same time, Trump comes out looking a little diminished. He's elevated visually from where we are as the viewer, but he looks small. Melania looks small. And you know, a lot of people who visit Mount Rushmore say, it's not as big as I thought it was. And so even Mount Rushmore looks kind of small with that wide sky above it. There's one other thing that's really interesting about this photograph, and I think very rare, is that I love a photo where you can hear almost as much as you can see. And what you've got here between the band and what we know is the ear-splitting experience of these flyovers is this cacophony, this photograph through the representation of sound bombards our senses in the same way that Trump does. It really reflects how much he is a noise machine. He uses words and distraction information as a sonic weapon. So this also turns the noise back on him. If you take a look at Trump's speech that he gave at Mount Rushmore, the speech is nuts in a variety of ways. But what I want to highlight just really briefly is the fact that the speech itself is really about visual symbolism and icons and imagery. If you look at that speech and the way he talks about Mount Rushmore and then other monuments, it is as if someone is about to come and blow up Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore itself, the edifice, not even the symbolism, the edifice is under threat. And he developed develops that idea then to talk about the usual kind of Trump themes. But I found that really, really interesting. I think a lot of people probably thought, oh, of course, Trump would go to Mount Rushmore. He wants to associate himself with these great iconic presidents and yada, yada, and you know, make America great again. And that's definitely one way to read the choice of the symbolism of Mount Rushmore. The sculptor of Mount Rushmore was a guy named Gutzon Borglum. In the early 20th century, he had ties to white supremacists and the Klan. Mount Rushmore itself is a contested site on stolen land representing presidents, many of whom have problematic histories of their own. It's in the space of the Black Hills, which is a sacred space for Native Americans. So the existence of Mount Rushmore itself, in a lot of ways, really nicely reflects the kind of (laughs) divisiveness and conflict that Trump was amplifying with that speech. Our next segment we call The Look, and here we're interested in how a photograph might push the visual boundaries to tell a story. This photo was taken by Lawrence Bryant for Reuters. Here we see Mark McCloskey and his wife Patricia pointing firearms at racial justice protesters on June 28th. The incident took place when marchers passed the couple's home, which is located in a private subdivision in the Forest Park area of St. Louis. The marchers were destined for a protest at the mayor's house after she publicized the names of constituents calling for defunding the police. Video and photos of the incident went viral and were widely discussed on social media as examples of how white fear and white privilege can lead to violence against African Americans. This photograph to me is a portrait of fear as aggression. 
the gun being used as a kind of amplifier of communication. The fact that the gun is essentially shooting out of her mouth really highlights that. And so we get this connection of speech to violence. But to me, her posture is a posture of fear, even though she's protected by a man with a gun and presumably a house that she can safely retreat to. I agree that these people are terrified on one level, but then, you know, they're really much more on offense than they are on defense. And one thing that speaks to me here also is that she looks really scary and she's also like holding her car keys. So it's hard to think of her as that terrified when she might at the same time be on her way out to do an errand or something. There's kind of some mixed messages there in terms of the emotional dimension. And that ambiguity, I think, really points to that kind of just jacked up nature of this photograph, right? There are these other moments, too, where you have this kind of overreaction of white people in the media, in particular, recently, white women, the Amy Cooper incident in Central Park being probably the most vivid example recently, where white women who erroneously believe that they are under attack or being threatened by especially black men call the police, become aggressive of themselves, make threats. In his narrative about kind of how this moment went down as he was photographing it, Lawrence Bryant talked about how he was making his images and she sort of ran out with her gun pointed and kind of escalated the situation for everybody present. She's not only kind of waving her gun around, she's pointing her gun specifically at particular people. And you see that in the other photos. And so that kind of aggressive engagement, it ties to a really long history of white women using their safety and privilege in problematic ways when they feel under threat, being backed up by the white men in their lives. What's also interesting to me about is this house. And this house is absolutely enormous. It's 18,000 square feet. One of the key quotes here was McCloskey telling a local radio station, I lived in the city of St. Louis for 32 years. We were, you know, urban pioneers back when we bought on Portland Place in 1988. Yeah. And you have to think that if they put their guns down and took two steps back and, you know, maybe retreated onto their porch, certainly their own individual safety, if that's what they're really concerned about, would have been assured. One other thing in terms of that figure in the foreground, the person has like this quality of an observer or a witness. In a way, the posture of that figure is something about the current moment bringing out some of the realities of race in America. Our next segment we call The Pick, and here we're interested in what makes a photograph a good editorial choice among lots of options. This photo is a self-portrait by photographer Mark Clennon. It was taken June 4th at a racial justice rally in Cadman Plaza Park in downtown Brooklyn. Terrence Floyd, the brother of George Floyd, was the featured speaker. This image appeared in a New Yorker photo feature highlighting Clennon's work on that day. This photo is just brilliant for the way that it is both visually distorting and also at the same time incredibly clarifying. Clennon has put himself in the middle of the frame, in the middle of a plea for Black lives, and by turning the mirror and the lens essentially on himself, he's inviting us to think about the space between the photographer and those being photographed, and also between himself as a Black man and the rest of the crowd, which, although I think it was pretty diverse at the march overall, this image shows what looks to be a majority of people who are white. In the article at one point, Clinton talks about police presence and snipers on the roofs and feeling unsafe as a black man at the event, at the rally. And he also said that he felt like his camera offered him some protection. So when you think about the picture in that context, Clinton's really locating himself through his role or his identity as a photographer. And I think it's important, too, to highlight one of the possible reasons why that man is holding a mirror, which is the argument that the media needs to look at itself, that protesters should not be visually targeted by media or by surveillance, right? And so the man in the photograph who is holding the mirror and who has written that inscription on it is essentially inviting this critique that Clennon then accepts, right? He says, yes, I am going to picture myself in the context of this mirror. So the photograph is doing so many different things. And what I really love is that choice that Clennon made both a visually interesting and really smart choice, but also a really kind of thoughtful, compelling choice to put himself into the middle of the story. 
the text in the mirror says an attack against one of us is an attack against all, stop black slaughter. And then when you see yourself in that mirror against those words, what it does is it ascribes complicity and also accountability. So I think when a white person shows up and sees their self in an image like that, it works a much different way. And by extension, we can think, okay, Clennon created a self-portrait of himself and created this interesting dialogue about that. But he's still pointing his camera at us, the viewer, isn't he? So as you say, if we read the protester's original choice as look at yourself, take a look at yourself, and kind of where do you want to be in the context of all of this? Clennon is also, to a certain extent, amplifying that image. We have Clennon, the photographer, presumably now taking a picture of us. When we understand that Clennon is capturing the photo and then amplifying it to what would be a wide, diverse audience with a lot of white people looking at this, it brings that accountability to a very wide audience. Thank you for joining us. Follow us on our website, on our Instagram feed, and also on Twitter. And we will see you again in two weeks.